All right. The objectives of this webinar are to equip students with tools to navigate the college admissions and funding process with a plan, share tips on researching and applying for scholarships, and to share relevant information regarding the COVID-19 impacts. Look forward to an interactive discussion. This AKA collaboration consists of 11 chapters. We are led by Dr. Christy Murray, who is a member of Psi Psi Omega chapter. The 11 chapters range from Danville, Virginia, all the way to Orlando, Florida. Now, let me share a little bit with you about Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. We are an international Greek letter nonprofit service organization. We were founded on the campus of Howard University, which is an HBCU, on January 15th, 19 over 8. We have more than 300,000 members worldwide. Our current theme is exemplifying excellence through sustainable service. We address community needs through five target program initiatives. They are target one, HBCU for Life, a call to action, and our signature program, hashtag CAP. Target two, women's health care and wellness. Target three, building economic legacy. Target four, the arts. And target five, global impact. And I would like to share, and I would be remiss if I did not let you know that Dr. Glenda Glover, who is the current president of Tennessee State University, is also the international president for Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Now, let me share a little bit about Target One, the program initiative under HBCU for Life. And that stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And I think some of us are wearing our HBCU pair today. I do have on my Norfolk State pair and I'm representing. And I can see that Dr. Christie has on her Hampton University uh, t-shirt, she is representing. But we're here to promote HBCUs and share factual information. I cannot see my other sisters out there, but I'm sure that some of them are representing as well. And our hashtag cap signature program is a program where we attempt to assist high school students and seniors throughout the entire college admissions process to make that a little bit easier for them as they navigate through. We have several upcoming events and we'd like for you to take note of them. It is not time yet to register, but we'll share a little bit about what's going to be coming up in the upcoming months. In April, we will have an SAT prep program in which we will share strategies for high school students. This will be held on Sunday, April 24th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. In the month of May, we will have another workshop and this one will be on the ACT prep. That will be held on Sunday, May 22nd, again from 4 o'clock to 5.30 p.m., and that too is open to our high school students. In the month of June, we are going to have an HBCU and a PWI college officials panel discussion. And I'm sure most of you all probably know, as I stated already, HBCU, Historically Black Colleges and Universities, PWIs, predominantly white colleges a predominantly white institution. And that one will be held on Sunday, June 5th from four o'clock to 5.30 p.m. In the month of July, we are going to host an essay writing and letters of recommendation on Sunday, July 31st, again from four o'clock p.m. to 5.30 p.m. And high school students and parents are welcome to attend all of these events. Now, here's the fun part. I'd like to introduce to you one of my sisters who we know very well. We have done this collaboration for about three years now, and she has led us and led us with success throughout. I'm gonna let you know, first of all, that she is a member of Psi Psi Omega, which serves the Stafford and Fauquier. I always have a difficult time pronouncing that city, so forgive me, uh, Fauquier County. In her role with her chapter, she serves as the vice president, as well as the program chairman. She is a well-known author and entrepreneur, but I won't delay any further. I'm going to let her share her story 
I'd like to now present to you Dr. Christy Murray. Thank Dr. you Murray. very, thank you very much, Gracie, for your opening remarks and your kind introduction. Again, greetings to everyone and thank you to all the students and parents and AKA members and all others who are joining us today. Um, if we have other AKA members who we are, are not a part of the um, collaboration, but you have joined us today, let us know who you are in the chat as we're talking. Uh, we you know, wanna certainly um, recognize any um, other AKA member or any Divine Nine members for that, for that fact. So if you are, please shout out and tell us who you are. So I wanna go ahead and get started. Um, first, um, I, I wanna go back and just say that um, it's very important um, to take this time to start thinking about your college plans. What do you wanna do life beyond high school? And so with that being said, I spent a lot of time and, and I'll you know share a little bit about my um, personal story. Back when I was in high school, I was the youngest of three girls. My sisters were twins and already in college. And when I started visiting all these college campuses, in particular, the Hampton University, I fell in love. I went home and said, Mom, I want to go to Hampton University. And she said, wait a minute, your sisters are in college. I can't afford it. Hampton's a private school, so we're going to have to figure something else out. Maybe go to a, you know, in-state public school where it's a little bit more affordable. Not something I really wanted to do. So my mother said, well, look, if you want to go to Hampton, you're going to have to try to help find some funding to get you to Hampton. So I started rolling up my sleeves, talking to folks, um, sharing what my interests were to go to Hampton, major in engineering, and so on. Well, one day, I'm sitting in a class, and my school counselor comes and pulls me out my senior year. And she said, hey, Christy, what if I told you that I just had the scholarship to cross my desk? They're looking for a student who wants to go to Hampton University and major in, elect in, major in engineering. Would you be interested in applying? I was like, well, absolutely. So she said, there's only one caveat your whole application must be postmarked by tomorrow. And I said, tomorrow? And she said, yes. Yeah. She said, can you make it happen? I said, well, the question is, can you get my transcripts out that quick? Because if you know anything about a high school transcript process, it's usually not an overnight exercise. So let that be the first golden nugget for you. Make sure you know what that process is for you. I told her I could do my part if she could do hers, and she did. Long story short, I applied. I went home. I had a system. I was prepared, and I was able to pull from letters of recommendation I already had. I was able to pull from sample essays I had written and tweak those essays, and I got that pack package off and in the mail. Two interviews later, yes, the scholarship entity actually interviewed me twice. I was actually selected for this scholarship. As a part of that prog process, not only did I get the scholarship to attend Hampton for four years, actually I was a five-year engineering student, for five years, it also came with summer internships every summer that I was in college and a full-time job when I graduated from college. And I had that entire package the day I walked across the high school stage. And I share that to you because one, I'm incredibly blessed to have had that opportunity. Two, closed mouths don't get fed. And had I not opened my mouth and shared with my school counselor that I was interested, I had forethought about what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, she would not have been able to help me as effectively as she was able to. So that is the reason why we're sharing the information on the hashtag CAP program today. And um, over the last four years, we've been running these programs. Um, I'll tell you, because I had that help, I knew that I, it was my mission to also help other students to be able to pursue their college aspirations too. That's why I wrote these two books, the first on the left, College Planning Strategies. I wish someone had told me because we all learn a lot as we go through this process and we want to streamline it for you. And then the second book, College Funding Strategies, I wish someone had told me. Why? Because after I wrote the first, wrote the first book, you don't know how many parents, I had hundreds of parents all over the country coming up to me and saying, you know what, Christy, that's great. We got to accept it, but guess what? We don't know how we're going to pay for it. And so I said, ah, so we've got to talk about both of those realities really in the same conversation. And that's what we're going to try to do today with our talk. Now, the strategies in both of these books work. They're not just books that were written by some ambiguous person who hasn't been kept up to date. 
It's been written by someone who not only had help getting to school, but I also have two students, two sons that are currently in college right now. So I'm also a parent. So I, I come to you as a parent, as someone who's been in different um, roles throughout this process. My son on the left, he's at ODU. Son on the right, he plays football at Norfolk State. Both are doing really well. And both of them are entrepreneurs. So my next golden nugget is you can do more than one thing and you can do more than one thing well at a time. So don't think that you can only just focus on academics or just focus on working. You can actually have some balance. And that's one of the things that I would encourage each of you to think about. So what am I going to do? So we're going to talk a little bit today. Um, I'm going to share a little bit in my presentation, and then we're going to do um, have some closing remarks when I'm done. So don't leave after you hear me speak. Stick around, and we're going to give you a brief survey, a link to a survey, and then we are um, we have some giveaways for you. So let me just jump right in. So there's five key areas that I want to talk about when it comes to college planning and funding. It's a roadmap. So we're going to go on a little brief journey today. But hopefully by the end of this journey, you will feel more comfortable with what you need to do to get through the process. We're going to start out talking about how do you develop a plan and use your time wisely. Then what does it mean to create a scholar profile? And number three is extremely, extremely important. How do you go about choosing a major and choosing colleges? Had I not had a major in mind, had I not thought about which college I was interested in, it might have uh, slowed down, it might not have completely eliminated, but slowed down my ability to look for those scholarships I really needed. Number four, we certainly are going to talk about how do you actually go through the application process, how do you apply to colleges, and lastly, we're going to touch on generally how to get through the funding process in this whole endeavor. So the first thing I love to kick off my discussions with is a where are you now assessment. In order to know where you're going, you need a baseline. If you're going on any trip and you're putting in something in your GPS, you always have to start with an initial place. Where are you now? In order to know where you're going to get to. So that is what I created. It's a 10 question, easy little quiz. We're not gonna take it in its entirety right now, but I am gonna invite all of my students and parents, if you're a parent and you're on representing your child and they may or may not have been able to attend, please join in and participate. But I'm going to handpick just a couple of these questions in the interest of time. And I, wanna, I want you to respond in the chat. You don't have to come off mute, but respond in the chat and let me know what you think. The first question, you don't have to tell me what your GPA is, but I would like to know if you know it. So if you're a student, do you know your current GPA? If you're a parent, do you know your child's GPA? Let me know in the chat. Margo say yes, Diamond yes, Kendall says yes, Janae says yes. Excellent, I'm seeing a lot of yeses. I don't see, a no, I don't see any no's. So that's very encouraging. It is extremely important. Every semester, you're in high school and college, don't forget this when you get to college, but both, when you're in high school, after every semester, you should be getting your most updated copy of your transcript and an updated GPA. You can't influence what you don't know. If you need to change classes, you need to update your graduation requirements, get a tutor, then it gives you the maximum ability to really know what you need to do next. I'm going to jump down to another question. Let's see. Um, number five, true or false, the best time to apply for college is in the spring of your senior year. How many of you think that's true? The spring of your senior year? Okay, good. I'm so encouraged that I don't see any trues. I'm seeing a lot of falses come in, and the falses are absolutely correct. If you wait until the spring of your senior year, you're behind the curveball. It's not impossible, but you're definitely, you have an uphill battle. And here's why. If you, when you apply, and we do encourage as a part of our CAP program for students to be applying to colleges early in the fall, generally speaking, somewhere between September and December of each year. You can do it a little bit earlier, you can do it a little bit later, but that is the prime time in my opinion, and here's why. Once you apply to school, that starts so many other things, domino affecting other things that will take place after that. Once you apply to school, then colleges start calculating how much money does this person need? How much money can we offer that student? If you wait until the spring to apply, you won't find out what kind of funding you might be entitled to until later on in your senior year, 
and then you may end up paying more out of pocket. Most people don't realize that colleges give out their money on a first come first serve basis. So those students who apply early in the fall get access to financial aid and when it's gone, it's gone. So by the spring, those students who waited might find themselves a bit disadvantaged um, getting access to some of the funding that they might need. And then um, the last question I'm gonna ask is number 10, true or false? Social media accounts and your online reputation does not matter. How many of you think that you can post anything you want online and hey, it'll go away on Snapchat like my son say, it's gone mama, you can't see it anymore. And I remind him, it's never gone sweetheart, you just can't see it, but it's on a server somewhere and can still be accessed. I'm so happy to see a bunch of falses in the chat. How you show up does matter. And I encourage students to think about it in three ways. How you show up matters on paper, online, and absolutely in person. And you have to manage yourself as if you are your own personal brand and you get to decide what you put out into the atmosphere about yourself. College admissions officials, um, employers, folks who may be offering internships, and even scholarships, they're going out now and they're Googling students. And they wanna find out, is this student a good fit for my money? for my college, for my job, et cetera. And you wanna make sure that you put the answer out there before what they see does by having your reputation, your brand managed and is representing you um, in every capacity. So that is the uh, self-assessment. I'm gonna go back to it just for one more second. Here's the value in making sure you can answer all 10 of these questions. Um, if you don't know your GPA, um, if you don't know your school counselor's name, if you don't know the process of getting your transcripts, you don't know what you want to major in, you don't know what college you want to attend, those kind of things are very important early on. Because the more you're able to answer those questions, the better you're able to put together your college plan. Your college plan should be simple but effective. And it's very important to have a plan because that will enable you to maximize your time. And time is the one commodity that none of us can get more of. You can get more money, you can get more friends, and for those who like social media, you can get more likes and comments, but you have the same 24 hours, seven days a week. So how you use your time is very important. I like to encourage students to create a simple plan, working with your parents, parents working with your children. It should have what actions you need to take, your sophomore, freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, et cetera. It should have what type of action it is. Is it a SAT action? Is it a, a college application action? Whatever those categories are. And then that third column, the cost. Now I know most students don't really care about that. My parents got it covered, but I know a lot of parents do. So I would encourage you to include the cost for each activity as well. I'll tell you a quick example. My son, a couple years ago when he was a senior, he had applied to over 13 schools. Anybody, um, can anybody guess in the chat how much we paid in application fees? Just wager a guess. It doesn't have to be, um, you don't have to be precise, but let me know if you have any idea how much 13 application fees might cost. And the value of putting the cost here is because it gives your parents, give you and your parents, an opportunity to prepare financially for what's to come as well. Um, thanks, Teresa, for hedging a guess. Um, Janae says 500, Claudette says 600, Margo says 250. Um, I would say Herb is probably the closest, $980. Herb said $800. I spent almost $1,000 on application fees, only because my son was playing sports and he wanted to apply to multiple schools because he thought he might be getting offers. But my whole point is the financial aspects matter. And so as you can anticipate those, put them on your plan. Make sure you have a start date. When does this have to start? When does this have to get completed by? And then measure your progress. I'm about 50% complete on this one, 85% on that activity. And then any other notes, there may be some special nuances you might wanna note on your plan. The reason why I share this with you is because if you have a plan, you're more likely to succeed. Without a plan, you, many students and parents fumble their way through. And then they reach out to me and they need help their senior year because they haven't done some of the things that had they put a simple plan in place could have helped them. Now, in my book, and I also have workbooks that go with the books that I 
um, have published. And I have student workbooks. And in the back of the books and the student workbooks are checklists. Um, starting, I think, eighth grade, eighth through the 12th grade, you'll find a checklist in the books and in my workbooks. But what this does, it helps you to be able to say, hi, if I'm a senior, and this is just an example, but this is what I have for the seniors. And if you're a senior, let me know in the chat what grade you're in. This is a great time for me to find out from students if you are in ninth grade, 12th grade, because I'd love to see if I have seniors in the house today. Looks like we do have some seniors, which is great, and 11th graders. And I'll tell you, juniors, sophomores, freshmen, the earlier you start this process, please do not think it is too early for you to start if you're in the 10th grade. And I did see someone, Roxanne's in the 10th grade. Perfect timing, Roxanne, because this will help you. Have a plan, use a timeline, and look at some of these things on the checklist. Now, my only interest purpose right now is to say you should be thinking about a lot of different things as you hit high school. You should be thinking about what you want to major in, what type of colleges you might want to attend. Are you even visiting schools, which I highly encourage, whether you can go physically and visit or visit virtually. You have some options nowadays. Um, are you starting to prepare your essays? Do you know your transcript process? Are you, if you're a senior, you should be well underway with some of these activities. And I'm hoping my seniors are um, underway with them. But I want to expose you to this and um, Make sure that you write down what you have to do each year you're in school. Don't wait till your senior year to start doing 100 different things that you could have gotten ahead of um, the game with as early as your freshman year in some cases. Start thinking about those things. Now, as you build your plan and you have a checklist of things every year, I know I need to be focused on these things, these things, and these things. Here's something else I would encourage you to do. Create a scholar profile. Now, some of you are like, well, what is that, Miss Christie? Well, you've probably heard it referred to as a re one-page resume, and I don't encourage you going over one page. It could be called a brag sheet or self-assessment. Um, I've heard all of those. But here's what it really is. Remember I said how you show up on paper matters? This is a perfect way to show up very well on paper and tell the story of who you are. You can tell your story by highlighting your educational goals. Now, take my example. I would have said, I would love to go attend a four-year college, accredited college or university, um, and major in electrical engineering. And if I was more specific, I would say I want to attend the Hampton University and major in electrical engineering. And then I would share things about my past, like, um, or my other educational goal, uh, situation, like I attend this high school, this is my current GPA, here's my SAT and ACT test scores. Whatever those relevant factors are that you want to stick out and highlight about yourself. And then share your past experiences. If you have working experience, community service experiences, um, if you have honors, awards, um, any other activities, maybe you're in um, extracurricular activities or sports at your school, and if you have other talents or interests, maybe you play an interest instrument, maybe you're a computer programmer, maybe you're a great artist, highlight those things that make you uniquely you. And here's the value of this scholar profile. You can use it for your college applications or your scholarship applications. Imagine attaching this to your college application or scholarship application, and yours is the only package that has this attached. Now you have just differentiated yourself from everybody else who's applied, which is always your number one goal. Secondly, only do this with an application if the entity, whether it's a school or a scholarship entity, says that they are willing to accept additional information. If a school or, or a scholarship entity says, only provide us with what we asked you for, don't submit it. But if they give you that leeway, absolutely do so. You can also use it for letters of recommendation. Imagine if um, Ms. Christie was writing a letter of recommendation for you and you actually had the scholar profile to hand me and I could learn a lot more about you on this one pager. It'll help me to write a letter a lot quicker. And then when you're writing your own essays, you ever try to remember what you did four years ago? I have a hard time remembering what I did yesterday. So if you're like me, you would want to be able to write these things down so when it's time for you to write an essay, you can recall all those wonderful things you've done over your entire high school matriculation in one place. So a lot of value in this one one-page summary that tells the story of who you are. When it is complete, it is as simple as this. 
If you go to my website, one of my websites, it's listed here, or you can even put in the QR code, it give, it'll pull up a downloadable template for you to use. So I don't just share with students what they should do. I give them the tools to be able to do it and do it with ease. So this is just an example of a template that you can use. You notice it's clean, it's crisp, it should have no misspelled words, it should have great alignment and formatting, it is professional. This is part of your brand, so it needs to represent you and even how it looks. All right, so once you create that scholar profile, take a look at it. If you're a sophomore or a freshman or a junior, create it now. Don't wait until your senior year, do it now. Fill in everything you know about yourself now and then look for gaps. Look at what you're strong in. Oh, I've really done great in these areas, but look where you have gaps and say, you know what? I need to do a little bit more community service. I need to get my GPA up. I need to get in leadership activities, you name it, and close those gaps over the next couple of years. Use that time to be strategic. And then I did this with my son. They started back when they were in the sixth grade and they hated it. But by the time they hit their senior year, they were so happy they had the scholar profile because it saved them a lot of time and energy. And every summer and every winter break, I would have them sit down for just five or 10 minutes and update it and save it with a new date so that they always had a current copy of it if they needed to pull from it. So those are the key strategies to creating your scholar profile. And I highly encourage, if you don't have one, students, create one, or parents, if your child doesn't want to create it, uh, too bad, have them create one anyway, because it's going to save them a lot of time and uh, effort later. I did it as a punishment one year. The first year, I had my sons that got on my nerves, so I had them sit down and fill it out. And I always give them punishments that help them. It would irritate them, but it would help them progress later on. And this was one of those exercises that I knew would be helpful. So now you have your scholar profile. We're going to claim it today. Every student's going to go home. Um, or you know, in this Zoom and in the next week or so, they're gonna create a scholar profile. One of the gaps you might have on your scholar profile is, hmm, I don't know what I wanna major in yet. It's okay. Now, if you're a senior, if you're a senior, let me know in the chat what you're thinking about major in because you're filling out college applications or you should have already have started filling those out and be thinking about potential majors. So let me know, seniors, what you're thinking about. But as you're choosing a major, you want to narrow it down and start to think about um, this long before you hit college. Now, most colleges will tell you that you don't really need to declare a major until your sophomore year of college. I don't advocate for that. What if I had waited to my sophomore year of college? Would I have had that scholarship I talked about earlier? Uh-uh. Nobody would have known. Nobody would have known to even put that on my desk. And a lot of entities are giving out scholarships based on professions and careers. So you're doing yourself a disadvantage if you don't even at least start to think about it and narrow it down and say, well, I know it's in the STEM career field, so then you can target STEM scholarships later. So start thinking about those things. And I don't uh, recommend waiting until your sophomore year. You can always change your major, major later if you need to. But I would highly encourage all students to go into college at least with one or two ideas of what they want to major in. Now, um, I will also say that you should be choosing a major. <laughs> uh, this is probably one of the most important areas I really do believe we need to work with students on outside of funding. Because what you decide um, you want to do with the rest of your life, or at least the next phase of your life, is important. You can always change and maneuver as an adult, too. But you should be basing what you choose your major on based on what you're naturally good at, what you're interested in, uh, make sure it aligns with your value system, um, and any other abilities that you have. Um, I also encourage um, students to do some research. Don't just pick a major. Use these phones for something other than, um, you know, texting and DMing friends and on social media. Do actual research. Look at different jobs and find out which jobs need what type of degrees. And then, equally important, not most important, but equally, how much are the starting salaries? Now, I know before I get the question, well, Miss Christie, salary isn't everything. No, but eating is important. And so you want to make sure that you're picking majors that are in high demand, that there is opportunity for employment, and that you have pretty decent earning potential that matches the lifestyle in which you might be accustomed to living. Not your parents' lifestyle, but one in which you might be interested in. What does all that mean? 
if you want to um, have certain things or you want to be able to do certain things or help people in different ways, that might require resources. And so make sure you walk into that open-minded as you're doing your research so that you know what that looks like. You should not graduate from college in four years and you have no idea how much it was going to cost in that, to make money in that field. That is short-sighted, and you should absolutely be thinking about that as you're looking at majors in colleges. And then I would encourage you to ask people who know you well. Ask your parents, counselors, teachers, friends, other trusted family members and advisors. Miss Christie, you know me very well. What do, you think, what do you think I'm naturally good at, and what do you think that would be great, you know, or some different things you think I would be naturally or organically a good fit for? I guarantee you you'll get some really great ideas to explore. And then I would encourage you to talk to people that you already know who are in different career fields. Everybody you know has a job. Any particular reason we're not sitting down and having conversations that say, hey, Miss Christie, you're an electrical engineer. What did you like most about that? What did you find the most difficult or challenging? What's the starting salary for your career field? And asking those questions so that you can learn the, the pros and the cons of those career fields long before you choose a major. And then lastly, make a list of the five to 10 college majors that you're interested in based on all that research you've done. And use that as a tool to help you narrow it down as you approach your senior year. Now, as you approach your senior year, okay, now I've got two or three different majors. Now it's time to start thinking about schools. There are over 2,000 colleges in the United States. So don't feel pressured that there's only one school in the world that you can A, get into, or B, that has your particular major. Now, some students decide, well, I don't necessarily want to go to a four-year school. Well, good news. There are vocational and trade schools that have phenomenal career opportunities. Um, they teach great skills, uh, skills and in, 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 in job-specific skills for electricians, auto mechanics, HVAC technicians, and many, many more professions. Most of those programs last about two years, and you'll generally walk away with a license or a certificate or certification. I'll tell you what, it's, it's about to get warm. Let's say you hit July and your air conditioner goes out. You probably aren't calling Christy the electrical engineer to get your AC working. You're probably calling some phenomenal HVAC specialist or technician to come out and make sure that you can cool your home quickly. So there's a lot of value and there's a lot of, a lot of need and demand for all kinds of professions. So certainly explore these as an option. And then some students decide, well, I'm going to start out at a two-year college and go to a community or junior college. It'll save money. You can take a lot of core cl courses that way. And you can walk away earning an associate's degree. It's a great alternative to reduce costs and still work towards an associate degree. And then you have your traditional four-year colleges where you, you know, walk away with an undergraduate or bachelor's degree. In many cases, that's what, you know, thematically we talk about. But did you know, and I'll touch on this, I'll touch on it now, you can get scholarships for all three of these different categories of colleges. There are people giving out scholarships for trade schools. What? I didn't know that. Neither did I. But guess what? They are community colleges and four-year colleges. So please um, do your research. I also want to make sure that you know there's a difference between public and private schools. As I told you in my story, my mother was happy to remind me that Hampton was a private school. Well, Ms. Christie, what's the difference? Public schools are usually funded by federal and state government entities. They um, certainly provide a lot of the funding. Um, public schools are usually larger than private schools, and they usually have an in-state and an out-of-state tuition rating or tuition um, fees. Um, and those students who are attending out-of-state schools, like if you live in Virginia but you want to go to school in Florida, um, you're going to pay more tuition to go to that school in Florida if it's a public um, school. You're going to pay that out-of-state tuition. Now, private schools are a little bit different. They're still outstanding schools. Um, they usually are, don't get the predominant of their funding from federal um, or state governments. They do get some funding, but not the predominant amount. Um, some may be nonprofit, some may be for profit, um, but they also have one tuition rate. They don't have in state and out of state. They only have one. They don't care if you live in Virginia or if you live in California. You're going to pay the same thing to attend a private school. And they're generally more costly than public schools. 
So think about that. And as you're thinking about choosing a major, you should be going and looking at, um, not a major, but choosing a college. Once you've choo chosen a major and now you're looking at colleges, use one of those online search tools. Common App, Big Future, at College Board has a great tool. Um, collegescorecard.ed.gov, government has a great one. But you can actually search these colleges and find out what the requirements are, the programs, the whole nine yards. And then consider visiting schools. When my kids were younger, we would go on trips, wherever we went on trips, we would find local colleges there, whether it was a school they were interested in going to or not, but it was about creating exposure to different colleges. Here's why creating exposure is very helpful. Sometimes you don't know what you want until you know what you don't want. And so it gives you the ability to say, well, I like these things about the college, but I don't like these things. So now you can start to narrowly focus in on those things that you do. And then there may be some things that are important to you, like a smaller class size or a larger class size or far away from home or closer to home. Um, but figure out what are those things that are high on your priority list with choosing a college and then rank those things. Now, in my workbook, I also have another template, and I use this with my boys. I had them do that research on those five to 10 colleges, and most students will ask me, well, how many colleges do you recommend students apply for, apply to? I would say somewhere between five to 10. Now, if you're like, wait a minute, 10 is a lot, then maybe closer to the five in, depending on your specific situation, and everybody's situation is different. And I also recommend you applying to colleges at different price points. I wouldn't recommend you applying to 50, 10, $50,000 a year colleges. I think you should have some that are more affordable and some that may be a little bit more um, pricey if that's what you'd like to do. But you should have a spectrum of different type of colleges because you want to give yourself options at different ends of that spectrum. Now, on this little simple spreadsheet, I would highly recommend that you either use mine or create something similar that works for you. But it has all the information you need in one place. You'll list a college, where they're located, um, how much their tuition is, when their application is due, how much the fee is to pay, what are their um, admissions requirements, GPA, essay, et cetera. And then when you actually apply, I have a category on here that says date the application was submitted. And did I get accepted or not? Yes or no? And any other notes? What's the value in having this in one spreadsheet? My son and I could go down and look, oh wow, let's see which ones, oh these are really expensive. These aren't bad, these application fees. We could also rank them in the order that their application dates were coming up. So then we were applying for the ones that had the nearest term dates and then it gave us more time to work our way down the list. So have a simple list, put all the requirements in one place and then it'll give you the best ability to make a decision about what you wanna do next. So now that you have a list, you have a major, you have your five to 10 colleges already picked, y'all see where we're going on this road trip? Now we're at a point where, ha, we have a major, we have colleges. Now it's time to think about what is it gonna take to apply. To apply to school, um, it's a very, it's not, it could be an overwhelming process if you didn't have a plan and you didn't try to get organized and prepared. And that's what we wanna encourage each of you to do. Now, with that being said, the college application is the core part of the college application. Every college has its own application process, so don't think that it's a one size fit all because they're all unique. Generally speaking, they want to see your official high school transcripts, and for those students who may have attended more than one high school, please note you will need the transcripts, your final transcripts or your transcripts for each one of those high schools when you're applying to colleges. So make sure you know all those schools' processes if you've moved around and you have multiple high schools to consider. You'll need your essays. You have to be able to um, address their essay prompts. Not all schools require essays, but those that do will give you specific instructions. And I am an advocate for following instructions to the T. And then letters of recommendation. Make sure that if they're requiring them, again, not all schools do, but those who do, you want to make sure that you are also addressing those instructions. And then of course your SAT and or ACT test scores. Very important to make sure that you have those uh, available and ready to go when at the time in which you're applying. Now, there's different ways colleges allow you to apply. 
mostly online nowadays. I'm sure they're still accepting paper and, and mail application, but many of them have either a web, you can apply through their website or through another portal, which I'll talk about in just a minute, but there's electronic ways you can apply. And of course, those glorious application fees I talked about, um, there are certainly um, various fee ranges, anywhere from $0 to $100 has been the average of what I've seen um, going through these processes. Now, if you are a student who may have um, a financial hardship or you may have other uh, financial situations, check with your school counselor and check with the colleges because they may actually waive your application fee. So don't get discouraged if you're applying to colleges and you know say, hey, Miss Chrissy, I really can't afford to pay $75 for this application fee. Reach out to that college or university, share your story, and ask them if they could potentially waive it. Or check back with your school counselors to do the same. So now that you know the different parts of the application, we've talked a little bit about it already. When should you apply? Now, again, here's my window, September to December, and I want you to be aware of two different type of decisions. There's early decision and there's early action. Most people think they're the same, but they are not. Early decision means you, they generally have a deadline, usually the first to mid-November deadline, and you can only do one college. You can only apply to one college early decision. This means you know for a fact that if this school lets you in, <coughs> I'm going, like I knew Hampton. If Hampton says I'm in, I'm there. So that's the one school that you want to do early decision. And early decision is optional. You don't really have to do any school early decision. But if you do, make sure you understand that if you apply to that school and they accept you, that creates a binding agreement that you are enrolling in that institution and you're likely to go to that school. And it sends the strongest message that college, that college is your first choice. And you can only do it to one school. Then there's early action. You can apply to as many schools as you want early action. It just means somewhere between um, the November time frame, those colleges have, a, some colleges have an early action where they're accepting your applications. They're going to make decisions on who's in that first pool first, and those students that are going to apply later will fall into another category when they make a decision later on. Um, you don't have to commit to a particular school to do early action, and, but here's the value of doing early action, which is what I encourage. It gives you the ability to apply, find out you've been accepted, and then work on your financial aid much earlier your senior year. You want to get your money right. So get the application part out of the way so you can focus on getting your money right. And both um, early decision and early action, they generally um, allow you to make a decision by, um, they usually make a decision by mid-December or right after the holidays you'll start to hear from many of those colleges you apply to in the fall. Now, note too that the national response deadline to make a decision and enroll in colleges is May 1st of each year seniors. So seniors, if you are um, already applying to colleges and you're getting your um, acceptance letters back, open those acceptance letters up as soon as they come in, students and parents, follow instructions. And I never put this in here, but it's very important. Follow instructions. If they say there are deadlines coming up to get housing deposits, enrollment fees, Make sure you read those um, acceptance letters and follow their deadlines and their instructions because that may um, also um, be very important for the next steps in your process. So if you haven't heard, if you're applying to school and you haven't heard of the Common Application, let me introduce it to you. Um, we refer to it as the Common App. Let me know in the chat if you've ever heard of the Common App before, students. Um, there's over 900 colleges or institutions who are members of this particular portal. Um, it's an online website portal where you can create an account. Good, I'm glad to see some students who've heard of it. Once you create an account, you set up your specific profile. I love it, I use it with my sons, and um, it worked out great because once they set up that student profile, all their personal information could be migrated to multiple college applications. So easy, it saves so much time than going to 13 different colleges' websites. But check, you can do a research, and when you start to research your colleges, go ahead and set up your Common App account now, even though you may not be ready. If you're a sophomore, go ahead and set up your Common App account now. You don't have to wait till your senior year. 
and start researching colleges through it. It tells you their requirements right through this app as well. So you can learn about their tuition and all those things just through this one app. And when you're ready to apply to college, you can apply to multiple colleges from this one site. Their application is usually refreshed every August 1st. So in August of each year, um, that is the trigger for you to actually start um, putting in your information and um, making sure the essay prompts are still good and applying to schools. Each college has its own application fee, even through the Common App. So you'll want to look at each college and see if they even have an application fee, because some don't and others may. And then as you get to the end of uh, the process when you're applying for a particular college for their application, it'll prompt you at the end of their application how to pay for it. Now, the good thing is uh, roughly about 45% of the schools don't charge an application fee at all through the Common App. So that's another great um, reason why you should use it. Now, I also want to introduce you to the Common Black College app. Uh, Mr. Mason, I met him a few years ago at a AKA Leadership Conference. He was there on a um, HBCU panel. But he created this Common Black College app. He has over 60, and I keep meaning to update this, it's more than 60 HBCUs now. And there's roughly about 102 HBCUs in the United States. So more than half of those HBCUs are mem members of his common black college app portal. It works very similar to the one I just described. Here you pay an upfront $20 um, to create your account, but you can apply to multiple colleges. Most of the colleges in, in this particular portal, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, there is no additional application fee. So you pay your $20 and then you can apply to a certain number of schools for free after that. So that's something else to consider, especially if your college list has HBCUs on it. Both are phenomenal resources and I highly encourage students to use it. I also talked about official transcripts. The only thing that I'm going to add to what I've already said about it is make sure that you know the process early. Sophomores, juniors, parents, if you don't know the process, put that on your checklist and on your college plan that you're gonna create. Find out now. Um, when I found out, my sons were probably sophomores, and I got on my school counselor's nerve because I was, they knew me on a first name basis. But that was a good thing for me. But I knew early because I realized there was four or five different steps just to get the transcript out. Had I waited to the last minute when I was actually trying to apply for a college application, it would not have made it out in time. So the value is find out early, and pay attention to what you need to, especially in this COVID environment, some things are changing, even with getting your transcripts, make sure you know what those changes are. And lastly, double check to make sure your high schools have sent out what you need before you need, before your deadlines. Nothing worse than a college having your entire application package and they don't have your transcripts yet. And you're right, Cassandra, those who plan to, who fail to plan, plan to fail. So this is all a part of the process. Um, make sure they get them out and it's your responsibility, parents and students, to double check with those high schools. Don't wait till the last minute either. Make sure they give you some guarantee and confirmation that your stuff has been mailed out and that um, it's been received by the college. So that's transcripts. Next part of the um, college application are your essays and letters of recommendation. How many of you know that there are two types of essays and two types of letters of recommendation? And I'm talking about those together because um, they generally have similar purposes. You write letters, you, you write essays and get letters of recommendation for college admissions and they're answering the question, why is this person a good fit for college admissions? And then when you need essays and letters of recommendation for scholarships, is asking the question, why should we give this person our money? And so they're written with a slightly different slant. And I raise this with you so that if you are looking for letters of recommendation from teachers and coaches, et cetera, that you're asking for two different types. Hey, Miss Christie, I need the same letter, but one focused on admissions and one focused on scholarships. Can I get two different types so I can have those when I need to use them? Because they're written very differently. So as we talk about essays, I want to give some general guidance. Make sure you draft your essays early. In the summer, it would be my recommendation. 
If you are a junior, please make time this summer to do some of the things we've been talking about so far in the webinar, particularly researching your colleges, finding out what the requirements are, making that list, and writing those essays. You will, sit, you will thank yourself if you do it over the summer. And as you hit your senior year, when everything gets really busy really quick, oh my gosh, to have those essays already done and proofread will save you a lot of time and headache. And you can reuse that content over and over again. Never, ever, ever, ever delete essays or any writings you have, personal statements, essays, Save all of that content because you can repurpose it for this type of occasion. Get somebody to proofread your work. I am a two-time author. I have a PhD. I've written dissertations and reports to Congress, you name it. And I never send anything without getting another set of eyes on my work. Don't be so arrogant to think that you are error-proof. We all are human and we all look at things through different lenses. So make sure you get someone to look at your writing. There are free online proofreading resources. One that I'm very familiar with is called Grammarly. You upload your document to it, wait a few minutes, and it'll pull you back a nice red <laughs> marked up version of your document. Um, it's very humbling, I'll be honest. Um, when you see how well you thought you did versus what the feedback comes back. But it's very helpful to help you to strengthen your writing, and that's the goal, is to not have any errors when you're submitting your essays. Um, follow the directions. We talked about that. If they tell you to type it, don't handwrite it. If they tell you to handwrite it, don't type it. If they tell you to don't go over 500 word count, don't give them 501. Use your tools to make sure that you know exactly what the word count is. If they say write on a specific topic, at least they want, they want you to write on leadership, and you talking about something that has nothing to do with leadership, your application is going to the bottom of a, it's actually going to a, I'm not even going to waste my time category. And we don't want that to happen because I'm sure you've worked very hard. And um, make sure that you demonstrate that you know something about the entity. There's nothing worse than a student who, let's say, um, let's pick Hampton University. Um, and we know that they have certain core values. Then align with that. Maybe talk about that in your writing or how you recognize that they believe in communication, trust, I'm making this part up. But whatever those things that make them stand out and uniquely themselves, how do you align with that? Let them know that you've done some basic high-level research. It doesn't have to be extensive, but it needs to be at least surface level to say this person at least checked our website out. And share some of those things in a way that it naturally fits into your writing. And then, lastly, I talked to a student who had, um, she's in graduate school, but she had won over a million dollars worth of scholarships. And I had coffee with her um, probably about three years ago now. And I said, Maya, how, what did you do? How did you, how did, what did you put in your essays? I'm curious. And she said, all my essays include information not just about myself, but it has to be bigger than you. You have to be able to share what you're going to do to make a difference in your community, in your environment, in the world, through your major, through your community service, through your passion, but you've got to make it bigger than just you, even in your writing, even in a personal statement when they're asking you to write about you. Always find a way to connect it to be bigger than just you. And then you have your great letters of recommendation. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Anyone, teachers, school counselors, et cetera, can write those. A lot of times the entities may specify, I want one from a teacher, one from a school counselor, or one from someone in the community. You have to read their instructions and make sure you're getting letters from the right individuals. This again is a great opportunity for you to share your scholar profile with whoever's writing that letter. And if possible, Ask them to send you back a PDF signed version of your letters of recommendation. Why? So that you don't have to keep bothering them. And I always have, um, I always tell them to not make it to a particular school or entity. So I wouldn't have them say, Dear Hampton University, but here's what I would have them say, Dear College Admissions Representative. Why? Because you can take that same letter and use it with 10 different colleges you may be applying to without needing 10 different people to write 10 different letters of recommendation. Same with scholarship entities. Keep it general. Dear scholarship organization, I'm writing this letter on behalf of 
Gracie Bowers, and I would love to be able to, you know, highlight her experiences with blah, blah, blah. But keep it very general. Give your recommenders enough time. Give them the instructions and give them enough time to get you back a powerful and compelling letter. Make sure their deadline is before your final deadline so that you know you have everything you need and you're not sweating making sure that you get it at the last minute. And then here's one. I'm going to pick on, uh, let's see who I'm going to pick on. I'm going to pick on Miss Janice Taylor. Miss Janice, I'm a student. My name is Christy. I'm going to write my own letter of recommendation. And I'm going to go to my English 10 teacher, Miss Janice, and say, I need a recommendation. Here's how it's going to go. Hi, Miss Janice. How are you? Well, I don't know if you remember. I'm Christy. I was in your English 10 class, and I had such a great experience in your class. Now I'm a senior, and I am applying to colleges and for scholarships. And I would love it if you could write a letter of recommendation for me. Here is my scholar profile. Let me find it in the book real quick. Here it is. Here's my scholar profile. Oh, you can't see it anyway because I have my background screen on. But I have my scholar profile that I love to give you so that you can learn more about me. And I have taken the liberty of pre-drafting a letter of recommendation for you to consider and tailor. Um, I'll be happy to email it to you, and that way you can customize it based on what you'd like to say about me. But this will give you, get you started um, through the process. Now, Ms. Janice, can you come off mute and let me know how likely you would be to write a letter of recommendation for a student who was that proactive? I would love to write that letter for that young person. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I would be honored to have her write it because <laughs> I, um, I, I didn't waste her time. I tried to value add her time and let her know that I'm serious. Ms. Janice, would you bump my letter to the top of your list of students who asked you? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> that's what you want. That is absolutely. You want to create things that are value add, saving other people's time. Here's a sample letter. So in my book, in my um, college, uh, probably both of my books, this sample letter of recommendation is there. Again, Miss Christie is providing you with the tool. You just have to use it. It's already formatted. You can fill in the blanks. You can put in whatever adjectives you want to describe yourself. You can highlight whatever examples you want, but it gives you a framework. And it should be clean, error-free, and, and free of grammatical errors as well. All right, so that is letters of recommendation. We're just moving our way through. This is the last part of the college application. You have your SAT and ACT tests. Now, we know that we're in a COVID environment. Outside of COVID, you know what I tell all the students I work with? Take both tests. What? Yes, take them both. Figure out which one you naturally test the best at. Then you take a prep course for that one, and then you take that test again right after the prep course while that information is still fresh in your mind. So I would highly recommend, even with COVID, that you should still be taking at least one of these tests. Well, Miss Christie, I don't know. I don't have to take it because the colleges I want to go to are test optional. They're not requiring SAT scores. Oh, yes, you are. Miss Christie highly recommends that you take them anyway. Here's why. What these colleges aren't telling you is they're still using these test scores to give out merit scholarships. If you don't have a test score, you're not likely to be considered because they're looking at your test scores to determine how they're gonna give away some of that endowment funding. So, highly recommend you take it if you can safely take it in this um, you know, COVID environment. Please recommend that you do so. Um, is it okay to take both tests and submit the test with the highest scores, Casey? Absolutely. Take the test. Um, a lot of the tests will let you pick scores. Like if you take the SAT test twice, they can take your math, high math score from one test and your high English score from another test, put them together, and they'll be happy to give you your combined um, scores. Guess what, y'all? If you take the SAT and ACT when you register, they ask you which colleges you want your test score sent to. What happens if you haven't identified any colleges yet on that list of five to ten schools? Now you're at this point, you're registering, it's like, I don't even know what schools to put. Go back to the roadmap, and there's a reason why I put those things in the order I did. Because when you get here, you want to at least be able to put in your preliminary schools and have those scores sent to them every time you take the test so that they keep getting your updated scores. 
All these things come in handy because you'll need to send those scores to those schools. The good news about the SAT test is different from when way back in the day when I took it. They revamped that test and now it's more like it's more aligned with what you actually study in school versus the more um, abstract analyti analytical approach of the past. And so you want to make sure that you understand the differences. The ACT test has a science section. The SAT test does not. Instead, the SAT has two math sections. One you can use with the calculator and one you cannot. Now, you're wondering, well, which areas require which test? Well, the SAT, if you notice, it's like an orange kind of a color on this map on the right-hand corner of top right corner of the screen. Those are the areas geographically that predominant, the predominance of the students take the SAT. And then that blue, depending on your screen, purplish looking color, those are the predominant areas where students take the ACT. Now, do colleges take both tests? Generally speaking, they do. And as you're looking at the requirements, you'll be the first to know before I will, because you would have researched it to find out which test they really are looking for. And then you will know how to strategically register for those tests. Now, I took the liberty of putting in some of the upcoming test dates so that you can be mindful. Um, my sophomores and juniors, um, please register to take the, one of these tests this spring, this summer, um, before you hit your junior year, your senior year, because you want to be able to look at your scores, especially if you're taking it for the first time, and if you don't like what you see, you can, what, influence your outcome by getting in a prep course, preparing and, you know, studying and retaking it. If you wait till the last minute your senior year, you might only be able to get it in once or you're going to risk applying to colleges later than what you need and risking getting your money wrong because you won't be able to get those applications in on time. See, there's a lot of connections to a lot of these things that I'm sharing. And most families don't, families aren't, um, they, they may not get that, how these pieces fit together in that way. And two, also it's important to note, and I listed both the registration sites here uh, for the SAT test on the left and the ACT on the right. You do have to go to their websites and register, and there is a registration fee generally associated um, with those. And I used to have a slide in here, but I want to say it's probably in the 50s. Um, I think my son first started out, it was in the 40s, and they, you know, fees keep going up just like everything else due to inflation. So you have to check the website for the most updated fees. If you cannot pay the SAT or ACT fees, do the same. Check with your school counselor because many schools can waive SAT and ACT test scores or they have a code that certain students can use. So certainly take advantage of that if, it's, if it applies. Now, what did I say? Take both tests, do some prep work. Um, here's what I want to say about this slide. Please don't just take one test and say I'm done, unless you just really blew it out of the water. You really want to make sure that you take it once, get in a prep course, whether it's Kaplan, Princeton Review, and I did list some here in this table for you to consider, um, at different price points as, as well. And so as you take these tests, and, and, and if you can't afford to pay $2.99 or more, there are free online preps that you can do as well. So whatever your price range, whatever you can afford, the goal is to prepare. And I wanted to give you some of the top um, prep resources that I know um, I've seen students do really well with here for you to consider. And once you finish prepping, let's say you took, let me go back one slide. Let's say you took uh, the. Uh, let's say you took a prep course and it ended April 31st, and you were getting ready to take the SAT on May 8th. You want to set up your prep coursework to finish right before that May 8th date. Why? Because all that stuff is still in your mind. All the strategies, techniques that they gave you is still fresh, and you're gonna go in there and you're gonna blow it out of the water. And once you get all that SAT stuff done, ha, you got everything you need to pull together a comprehensive college application package. Follow the instructions, create a mini checklist to make sure each college, all the documents they say need to be included, you're including. Um, this is a sample of what one could look like. 
I did this for my son. We, I just did script, bubbled it on a sheet of paper on the front of a, you know, a, a post-it. And we went through, and before we submitted, we made sure everything was included so that we didn't leave out anything. So now, that covers four key areas of our road map on this journey. We've gotten those college applications in. Now we feel like we can just sit back and we can, we're in cruise control for the rest of the trip, right? Wrong. Now we're rolling up our sleeves for the next important phase. And with this phase, it's really about navigating and the college funding process and essentially how you're going to pay for it. And that's important. So I like to start out by saying know what it costs to attend a college. It's just how the cost of attendance is really just simply put, how much is college going to cost? You have direct costs. These are things that you pay to the college itself, whether it's tuition and fees, room and board, to live on campus and eat. Those things go directly to the school. Then you have indirect costs. These are your own personal expenses, whether it's books, uh, personal items, clothing, cell phone, medical, school supplies, you name it. Those things are very important. And transportation, how are you going to get, if you're on campus or off campus, how are you going to get um, back and forth depending on your circumstance? Or even if you're far away from home, you have to meet me, even budget in. I live in California, but I'm in school in Virginia. I need to budget a few trips back home throughout the year. And during COVID, remember when COVID first hit? It was March. All those kids got sent home all over the country. And some of them were stranded because they either couldn't afford it some of them were international students. So you want to build in your plan at least a contingency to get back home um, at one way or another um, as in our new reality. And this last bullet is very important. You're going to hear me stress this. Go where you can afford. So many students have this great idea. If, the only reason I went to Hampton is because it became affordable. Had I not had the scholarships, I likely would have gone somewhere else because I knew that my mother was very adamant about going where you can afford. Now, I say doing it All right, we're catching some interference. <laughs> please, hello, please mute your phone, thank you. All right, so as you're picking, going, picking schools and you're gonna go where you can afford, make sure you know the difference. As you can see, just a simple depiction in-state public school, and this was back in 2019, 2020, but you get the point. It was $10,000 roughly. Double that if you want to go to that same school, but you're an out-of-state student. And you can almost triple it if you are going to a private school. Now, why is this important? It's not to discourage you from going to the private school you want to go to or going to school out-of-state. It is to be familiar with what you're walking into so you can prepare effectively to get the outcomes you want and find the funding you need to cover those costs. So as we talk about covering cost, it's important to think about financial aid. This is simply money that can help you to cover those costs and pay for college. The federal government gives away over $120 billion every year to over 13 million students. So there is a market for that. And there's different types of financial aid to help you cover those costs. Work study, where you can work on campus and por por portions of that funding can be used to offset some of your direct costs to the college. Grants, which is free money that you don't have to pay back. Scholarships, another source of free money you don't have to pay back. And ah, there's that dreaded student loan. Student loans is money that you can borrow from either the federal government or from other private lenders and you likely will have to pay it back with interest. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Education, there's 1.6 trillion people in the U.S. who owe student, no, excuse me, 1.6 trillion dollars in student loan debt. And there's 45 million borrowers who owe student loans. 45 million people. And the average student coming out with an undergraduate degree usually has about $32,000 in student loan debt. So this is a very important area that I'm very passionate about talking about to make sure that we triage this situation and we start to break the cycle on our youth having to take out so much student loan debt and graduating college already, um, you know, kind of over, overwhelmed with how to pay for those um, student loans. 
Now, what I will tell you is that to kick off any of the process getting federal financial aid, you have to fill out the free application for federal student aid, known as the FAFSA. You hear me refer to it as that. The website link is at the top here. And I encourage you, I don't care if you have all scholarships and you don't need a penny of financial aid, everybody should fill out a FAFSA every year starting your senior year in high school until you graduate from college. Every year you're in college, you must fill out this form every year. They're looking at your annual financial income profile for each year. And as your income changes, it refreshes and you fill out this fast for each year. Colleges receive the information from this FAFSA to calculate how much money they're going to give you. Well, Ms. Christie, do all colleges calculate this the same? Nope, they do not. Every college has its own formula. So you have to, again, get this. When you fill out the FAFSA, you still have to provide which colleges you want to send this FAFSA to. So my high school seniors, have you filled out the FAFSA? Let me know in the chat. My high school seniors, did you designate all those colleges that you either applied to or are applying to to get your FAFSA? Great, Kendall. I'm so encouraged to see that. Nikaila, thank you, Maquita. Herb, no, get on it, Herb. Come on, snap, snap. Get that FAFSA completed, her. If you need help, um, I'll, I'm happy to, you know, talk to you offline. But let's get the FAFSA in because nobody's going to give you money until they see this come in. No school. Because they need to be able to calculate how much you need versus how much they have available. And then they'll put together your package. It's free, Herb. So if, you, if you're holding back because you think you got to pay for it, it's free and you want to do this as a senior right now, it's very important, Herb, if you've applied to colleges and you don't have this FAFSA completed. Now, I did this because it's a lot, and I, I, I used to get myself confused trying to figure out and explain what happens with it. So in this blue box, it's very simple. You and your parents sit down together and you complete it. Go to that website on the previous slide. You put the colleges that you're applying to and you complete it. Um, through that website, it's going to calculate your expected family contribution, which is called an EFC. This is really saying how much money they think you can pay. That's what it simply means. And then they'll also send that same information to the colleges you specified. Then the colleges will get it in the green box, and they will do their little calculation, and they'll send you, each college you apply to should send you a separate award letter. You get those award letters, and you don't pick a school until you compare all of those to see who's giving you the best financial profile, the least money out of pocket that you have to pay or in student loans. And then they send that to you, and then you look at that in, in purple. The college sends it to you, your award letter, for all those colleges, and it'll say how much money they're going to give you and then how much they expect you to possibly pay out of pocket. You don't always end up paying out of pocket, po pocket but you also don't always, getting, you don't always get a lot in financial, financial aid either. So it could be either one of your realities, and it's all on a case-by-case -case based on your financials. Now, once you get that, you want to look and see in, in this orange box, how much do I have to pay? Now, if you have enough financial aid and you don't have to pay anything, and you can say, yes, I have enough aid, great, do nothing else. But if you have a shortfall and you see that you need to pay more and find more money than what was given to you, then that's where you need to start looking for scholarships and grants. Absolutely so. So once you start looking for those scholarships, again, they're gift aid, have that added to your plan. Schools should have all these colleges, all these um, entities, they all have, there's so many different scholarships out there, you want to have a plan for your whole scholarship approach. And look, you have time to do it because you've already applied to colleges, so now you should be spending the rest of your senior year just on this if you still need money. Get you a scholarship mentor. Anybody ever heard of like the uh, Coca-Cola scholarship, Bill and Melinda Gates? Go to their website. Look at past recipients. Reach out to them on um, Instagram, TikTok, wherever they are, on social media. 
and reach out to them and say, hey, my name is Christy. I saw that you were a past recipient of the Bill and Melinda Gates Scholarship. Would you be interested in mentoring me so that I can kind of get a little bit more, you know, um, insight on what you did and what was successful? Guess what? They would be honored to help you. But closed mouths don't get fed. So if you don't ask, you're not likely to get the help. Don't run from essays when it comes to scholarships, particularly now during COVID. Your essay writing skills is going to be a, cr a great differentiator and getting awarded a scholarship and not. Because in many cases, the, um, the scholarship uh, requirements are going to be less focused on test scores and more focused on actual essays and letters of recommendation. Uh, make sure you provide all the requested documentation and track your progress. It is not uncommon for you to apply to 10 to 15 scholarships your senior year or more. And I highly recommend the more the better, the more you increase your odds. But where are you going to put all this information at that you're applying for all these scholarships? In my book and workbook, there's another template. It's a simple spreadsheet. I created a tool that will help you to track it, all that same information, in one place. Now, I also talk about scholarships, the different types of scholarships. There's financial need-based scholarships. There are merit scholarships based solely on your academic capabilities and performance. There's interest-based. Maybe you like to sing, or in my case, think I can sing and really can't. But let's say you're a really good singer or you play an instrument and you really want to be able to target scholarships based around your own unique capabilities and strengths. There are so many scholarships. I was looking up a scholarship uh, last month. There were scholarships just because someone, because uh, there were vegan scholarships, just because you were vegetarian. So if you think that there's not a scholarship for something, I would challenge that. I would challenge you to find an area that you can't find a scholarship in. Disabilities, all kind of backgrounds and, and, and needs, there are scholarships in. Also, there are military scholarships, ROTC scholarships, and of course, athletic scholarships to consider. Now, what are the sources of scholarships? And, Ms. and I always get this question, Miss Christie, I don't know where to find scholarships. And here's what I often say, do you have Google? Do you have access to Google? If you do, then you have access to scholarships. You have to be able to narrow it down, know some of the things that you're good at, you're interested in, know some things about yourself or what you want to do, and start targeting scholarships in those different areas, such as what you see here. And that's why having a major or two picked out can help you to narrowly focus on scholarships. And there's scholarships everywhere. So for those who think that there aren't any scholarships, there's local scholarships in your community. And I highly encourage students to pursue local scholarships because not many students are applying for the local ones, which means it increases your chances of getting one. Ask your school counseling offices. They actually get a great list of scholarships. And if they're like my son's school, they actually email those out weekly. And so we were able to get a lot of great local scholarships that way. And then here's some other um, online uh, websites where you can um, also get scholarships. Um, you can join their, um, create a profile on their particular website, and you can put in your interest and your particular college major, and it'll filter out and provide lists of scholarships for you too. And then I, I would be remiss if I didn't throw in my AKA chapter, Psi Psi Omega, and we're going to try to provide on our website all of our collaboration chapters a link to their scholarships as well, because it's, now is the prime season for many, and I'll just say for our collaboration chapters, we're all looking for applicants. And so we're going to try to put together a list where you can um, get local um, AKA scholarships in your local areas as well. Um, but here's the list for Sasai Omega. So if you're a student in the Stafford and Falkir County, definitely take a snapshot of this, and I'll make sure we send you the student slides with this whole slide deck, um, and you'll be able to access and get um, our scholarship information. Also, uh, one of the things that I did last fall um, is I started a group. Um, as I hear about scholarships, I don't really have the capacity, capacity to talk to 500 people one-on-one -on -one about the same scholarships, but I do have the capacity to put those scholarships for 500 people in one place. So if you're on Facebook, go to Scholarships for Scholars, or if you're on Instagram, the same. And if you um, 
if you join either one of these areas, then I post scholarships. I'll be posting um, AKA collaboration scholarships and more in these places. So this is a great resource for you to get these scholarships in one place, in addition to the other areas that I've already talked about. So I'm pushing the end of my discussion today. And one of the things I will tell you is I can do a complete talk just on the funding piece alone, but we wanted to give you some exposure to some of the high level funding parts of this whole college admissions process. Um, but as you're going through, whether you are a sophomore or a senior, um, you should be well underway with your college admissions planning. Don't let it be an afterthought. Sit down with your parents, parents with your children, and start thinking about what do you want to do, what, what's going to be our approach, how we're going to pay for it, very important, and put together a system that will work for you. Track your college admissions and your funding efforts as you go along the way. It should not be done just by, um, by chance. It should be deliberate and intentional because you will, you'll be better served and you'll likely get the outcomes you want by having an effective plan. Get organized, parents. Have a folder. I had a folder, a hard a folder with all my son's information in it or binder. Also, create a folder just for your child's college uh, planning efforts on a website. I mean, not on your website, on your computer. And that way you can put all the transcripts in a folder, a subfolder, all the scholarships, all those things get organized with. And then make sure that you have a central place to save all those username and passwords you'll have. I have like 50 from working with my sons. You're not gonna remember them all, neither are your children. And so you wanna make sure that you put them in a central place that you can access them and your child can access them when you need to. The other thing I did with my sons, because these young people are not checking email, but a lot of business is still being conducted via email. And so we created uh, a joint um, email address. It was my son's name, college at gmail.com. Cam Lewis College at gmail.com. Why? Because all of everything we did related to college went to one central place. He had it on his phone, I had it on mine. We weren't missing um, key dates, we weren't missing actions we needed to take because we had one central place and we were both checking it daily. Um, and then I have this question. Um, if you are in need of funding and you don't get all the funding you need your first year of school, please don't stop looking for scholarships. When students ask me, Miss Christie, well, how long should I look for scholarships? Unless you are allergic to free money or gift aid, you should be looking for scholarships every year until you cross that college stage. So don't think that scholarships are a one-time endeavor. It is an endeavor until you can get to school debt-free or minimize how many student loans you have to pay out of pocket. Don't waste other people's time. As you saw with my example with Ms. Janice, I help Ms. Janice to help me. As much as you are able to help people to help you, I would encourage you to do so. And I also would encourage you, as the many, many people who are more than happy to help you along the way, would love to hear you say thank you. So make sure you thank those who have helped you throughout your journey. With that being said, follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I share a lot of these tips. My uh, website is here. Also, um, Herb, if you guys need help with the FAFSA, uh, my email address here, and this is not just a Herb, but any of the students, if you have questions that you um, want to follow up on, certainly reach out to me or others, and we'll make sure you get the help that you need. Um, and I'll make sure that I email these slides out to everybody as well. And with that being said, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Michelle for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray. That was a very comprehensive presentation that touched on so much uh, of the college application process. And speaking as a parent of a current uh, sophomore college student, I wish I had attended this webinar uh, before she uh, applied to college. So I just want to say thank you. And we'd also like to thank you, uh, students and parents, for joining us today. And we hope that you found this webinar inform informative. Now we'd like your feedback. Uh, we want to find out what you thought about today's presentation. So please click on the survey link in the chat or scan the QR code to complete the survey. Also tell us what topics you would like to see covered in the future. 
So we know we've covered a lot of information today, but we don't want you to worry because as Dr. Murray said, an email will be sent to all participants with the slides, the survey link and our upcoming events. And now we have some giveaways. We want to help four students get started on their college journey. We wanna give away copies of Dr. Murray's College Planning Strategies book and her College Funding Strategies books. And these books are filled with useful information and what I like to call gold nuggets to help you as you navigate the college application process. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to call four numbers between one and 65. And if your number is called, I'll ask that you unmute yourself, tell us your name and the high school you attend. So the first number I'm going to call is 33. Okay, okay. And we'll look at the registration list. And uh, we'll see who has a 30. I'll leave it on. Okay. Okay. And we have 80. We have 84 people. Thirty three. Tia Batty. So, 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 so you have to do two. Thirty four. Thirty four. A diamond the prince. A diamond the prince. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Diamond the prince. Diamond the prince. Hello, my name is Diamond the prince, and I attend Archbishop Carroll High School. Great, congratulations, Diamond. You'll be getting a copy of Dr. Murray's College Planning Strategies book. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the is completely down. The next number I'm going to call is number 14. I'm gonna look at it. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Give me one moment. Give me one moment. One moment. All right, I think that's better. I apologize for that disruption. So thank you. So Diamond is our first winner. And uh, Michelle, we're ready for the second winner. Okay, I called number 14. Uh, Latoya Bullock. All right, number 14, Latoya Bullock. Latoya, are you still out there? Latoya? Okay, I'll call another number, number 47. Okay. We'll go with uh, Amaya Rowe. Amaya Rowe? Amaya. Hello. Hi, Amaya. Um, I'm Amaya and I go to Tab High School in Virginia. Congratulations, Amaya. You will be receiving a copy of Dr. Murray's College Funding Strategies book. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next number I have is 54. Okay, number 54. Uh, Ariel Kittles. Ariel Kittles. Hi, my name is Arielle Kittles, and I attend Long County High School in Ludwigsy, Georgia. Hi, Arielle. Congratulations. You will be getting a copy of Dr. Murray's College Planning Strategies book. Thank you. And the last number I will call is number 64. 64. And that will be Yolanda Brennan. Brennan. Talia Ross. Talia Ross. 
Hi, this is Claudette Ross. I'm sitting in for my daughter, Talia. She goes to North Point High School in Waldorf, Maryland. Okay, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ross, um, I, we're going to reach out to you to make sure we have your address. We have all the other giveaway winners' addresses. So thank you all and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, I'd like to say we have some upcoming events. In April, we have the SAT prep strategies. And in May, we have the ACT prep strategies. In June, we have our college panel discussion featuring HBCU and PWI college officials. And in July, we have our essay writing webinar. So we hope that you'll take advantage of that and join us. And with that, I'll close this out. Oh, we're also on YouTube. Invest in Others LLC on YouTube. This is where you can see all of our past collaboration webinar recordings and videos, and you can watch those from the comfort of your home. You can take notes. So I encourage you to visit us on YouTube as well. And with that, at this time, we'll call for any questions. Okay, I see. Do you want to drop your questions in the chat? Um, I see one question from Roxanne. She asked where yes. she can purchase my book. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat for you. And you can purchase the book or the workbook with the templates that I talked about. Um, from the same website. And I'm gonna go back and see if there were earlier questions because I think there were something I missed earlier. Are there, oh, I think there's some new questions. Are there new questions? Um, where will we be able to find the slideshow? I will be sending those out to the same email address you use to register for the Eventbrite uh, event. You'll receive an email probably later um, this afternoon with the survey link and the student slides for your reference. So expect an email from the collaboration later today. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Okay, well, without seeing any other questions, um, again, please, we one, we thank you all for joining. We hope that you found this to be um, helpful and insightful today. So we will um, send those items out to you later today, and we invite you to join us. We have some really great webinars coming up. So look to hear from more from us as we have other events that we're gonna to bring to the students moving forward. And with that being said, we are going to yield you the rest of your beautiful Sunday afternoon and thank you for joining us again. Thank you all. <laughs>